think it must have been, uh, I think it was, my first job, full-time job ever as a teenager, my first real job. I was working for a landscaper named Ari Hasselman. I should have known as soon as I read his last name that this might be a difficult job. Ari was a bull of a man, just filled with strength. And he worked hard, and he expected his employees to work hard. And I remember one of the first weeks there, he said, I need you to dig a hole for a tree. And I said, I'm up for it, and what am I going to do it with? Here's a shovel. And yeah, make it six foot in diameter and six foot deep, because it's a five-foot ball. And if you could get that dug out by this afternoon when the tree arrives. So I'm like, by 11 o'clock on a very hot Ontario day, dying. Like, I'm sweating. I think I'm going to die. I feel like one of those guys in the mob film who's digging his own grave. It was just so difficult. And Ari would drop us off on sites, teams of one or two of us, three of us, and just let us run on the job for the day, and he'd expect it to be done. And in that job context, because I was so conscientious, I was always a freak about how many breaks should I take and how long of a break should I take. And I th whenever I was on a break, I thought I had to be back at work right away and I'd be taking too long of a break. But occasionally, there would be days when Ari would be working with us on the team. And surprising to me for that bull of a hard-working man, he would call out that we're going to take a break. And he would rest himself. And I remember one time, he would rest so much that he actually reclined into the grass under a tree. And I swear, he took a 10-minute nap under the tree. And during those break times, when my boss was taking a break, I found a freedom and a space and an ability to take fully engage the break that I'd never felt before. There is a freedom to rest that comes when you're resting with your boss. It's his company. You're his employee. It's his money, his schedule, his project. He's the one you're accountable to. He's the one who's watching you. He's the one who's measuring your progress. He's the one who writes the check. So when your boss says, take a break, downtime can be wide open, free. And when you know you're taking it with your boss, even more so, it can be renewing the way it's supposed to be and totally restful, and, and you can breathe again, and find yourself, and know who you are again. Rest can really be what rest is meant to be, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it whole, holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, translate employees if you have them, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, don't worry about the six, you know, science thing, we did that last year in our science series, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I'll make an assumption that God is your boss, but your boss says, take a day off once a week. A full day. Don't do any work on that day. And don't let anyone who works for you work on that day. When I was a kid, we would not go out on Sundays to restaurants because it would make other people work. And we never did. Such a ripoff. God tells you, God tells you to take a day off. 
Let go of all of your working and just be. Be before him and be with him for this dedicated one day. Now, knowing you the way I know most of you, none of you want to be told what to do. But in this case, shouldn't we like being told what to do? (laughs) I mean, take the whole day off. I'll, I'll take care of everything. Like, go. Play. Be. Be with me. Follow my lead, God says. So what gives? In our ever-exhausted, burning the candle on both ends, man, do I need a break. This job is going to kill me. This city doesn't stop. Work, 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 world. What gives? Why do we struggle to keep the commandment of taking one day out of seven? You can still work your off the other six days. Why? Do we not believe that God commanded this? Or are we just not interested in listening to God on this command? I'll follow 9 out of 10. I will never murder anybody. But like, give me a break on number 4. Or is God really not your boss? Not when it comes to our schedule anyway. I'm pointing at me on this, I hope you all realize. I, I, I have, it's this. It's all this is fault. I try to take a whole day off, and by the time I get to 7 or 8 o'clock, and doing the math that I really kind of turned off my phone at 8 the night before, and I'm feeling pretty rested. I was out doing photography or just relaxing or doing some stuff around the home. And I, I, I feel like I've got my Sabbath rest in. And technically, I think the 24 hours. And I'm just going to check Facebook because Facebook is relational, right? And so I'm just being relational with other people, right? But I know there's work stuff on Facebook all the time. And then once I check Facebook, I want to go to Twitter because I'm not going to really be talking to a real person. I'm just interacting with a few peers professionally, doing a little bit of reading. And by the time I bit on that, it goes to email, right? Which is usually the one I really don't want to touch. But on goes my phone. I used to blame my moral failures in this regard on my job. It's like 24-7. You've got to be there for people. And what if somebody needs you and wants you to live out your Messiah complex for them? And then I realized two things. Um, One, people can usually wait. Uh, No, three things. Two, no one ever calls you. And three, you're really not that good with people. So... But that's not, those aren't the primary reasons I don't keep the Sabbath as well as I should. The problem for me is much, much deeper uh, than that. The truth is, I don't want to trust God with my life on that day. I don't want to give up control. I don't want to give up complete control of everything to God. Which is somewhat ironic, seeing as I, of all of us, really do work for the man. (laughs) He really does write my check. I preach about providence all the time, that God holds everything, right? In your work, in our leisure, in all of his world. Sunday after Sunday, I'm up here preaching this idea of God holds it all by his Holy Spirit. Including me and my life, and my family, and my work. That God is a God who provides, always has provided, has been faithful in sustaining and keeping. I have never for one day wanted for food, as you can see, (laughs) or really anything in my 51 years. But you never know going forward if God's going to drop the ball.
I say I believe those things, but when it comes to actually trusting enough to obey the fourth commandment, I'm saying something else, which makes me unsettlingly realize that maybe I don't trust God with my life as much as I pretend to. And ironically, that is the exact problem that Sabbath is meant to protect you from. The Eerdmans Bible Dictionary teaches. I read a dictionary this week and found all kinds of great ideas. So everything from now on that sounds really smart. Eerdmans Bible Dictionary. The Sabbath is to be a, both a sign of and a time for remembering the distinct relationship between God and the people. It's a time for deep awareness of our ultimate relationship. By taking the Sabbath, you are making a testimony, a public profession of your faith. How so? The dictionary went on to say, by not making others work, we're reminded that God freed us from slavery. Literally, in the context of when the command was originally given to the Israelite people, but literally also, we believe, if you're into the Christian story, we've been saved out of slavery by God. Your eternal soul has been freed for ultimate rest, shalom, forever with God. We're freed slaves. He paid a huge price we sang and we're going to sing and we're going to remember on Friday and Sunday to get us out of our slavery for you. So the Sabbath reminds us that God is not a slave driver, not that kind of God. He's the most gracious, free, life-giving you imbuing, make room for you to be you kind of God imaginable and wants the ultimate and the best for you. Through all of the Ten Commandments, God wants through the keeping of these commandments for you to have the best life possible. And especially maybe so through this command to be with Him. By taking time off, we image the God who took time off. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In a very real sense, God is a God who is at rest. God can just be and fully be himself and is at peace, in balance. By by God's very definition, God is a being at rest, even as God does so, so much. Sabbath is a test of whether you define yourself as someone who can just be before God or someone who has to do before God or someone else to know who you are. To rest is to really believe that we are because God says we are. We are because we belong to God. We are the seen. We are the beheld. It's to believe that you are not defined by what you do and how well you do it and what the grade is and what the check is and what the adulation for your work ethic is. How people look at you as the guy who's always, or the woman who's always got the car in the parking lot first that day. Or last. By balancing our lives, we image this God who is at peace. And by going to church on Sunday, we say something as well. By going to church on the Sabbath and dedicating specific time to focus on worship and to learn more about God, we affirm just emblematically through one hour that this whole day is your day, God. 
And the whole day affirms emblematically that the whole week and our whole life, life, every, all of our hours belong to you, God. So coming to church is meant to kind of be a microcosm of that testimony of faith. And being here is saying physically in a space with a bunch of other people saying the same thing. I want to know you more, God. I want to deepen my relationship with you. I need you. I need community. I'm interdependent. I'm an interdependent being, interdependent on others and upon you. And I can't do it all on my own. And I'm weak, and I need to be reminded of this. And I'm thankful, and I need to say it to you somewhere. And you call us to do it in, in, in this body of yours called a church. And this time here, you might laugh at this, but it's meant to be like a foretaste of heaven, of communion with God. The love that you extend to somebody by listening to them after church over a coffee is meant to be a pointer to our listening God. The humility that you show so many of you week after week setting up a church and setting it down Sunday after Sunday shows a God who washed feet, right? And lays down his life. And the wisdom that you show when you teach speaks of the mind of God, the the way we say yes to how we're going to help care for kids who are being baptized speaks of his child-loving love. This is supposed to be a pointer to that, to, to him. What else? On Sabbath, by leaving work alone on the Sabbath... We also acknowledge that our work, it's not our work, it's God's work. It's not your work, it's His. He owns the Canadian government. Canada belongs to God. You do the work of an MP, you are working ultimately for the owner of Canada, the Lord of this dominion from sea to shining sea. You do work for those designers, but you don't. Because <laughs> he made them and he holds the economy of Calgary and all great design and aesthetic and beauty in line. By leaving money on the table, by not working as hard as you could, by working on the Sabbath. By leaving money on the table, we acknowledge that all money is God's. And we affirm that we understand that God wants us to share by not taking more than our share. We're saying, I believe in you, God, in that way. We give testimony that we understand the idea of enough being enough when we take a Sabbath day off. By going home on time, we acknowledge that we do know and understand that we cannot worship two gods and that our futures really are in God's hands and that we don't have to over nest egg our lives and prepare for the future over do that sabbath i think says all of that and much much more because the much much more is is not the all the negatives the things that we don't say it's it's what then fills the space of not saying that what we do say to the god who provides all of those things from your job to your money to your aptitudes to your skills to your opportunity to your having been born in canada Thank God for that. And having not been born in eastern Canada, but in Calgary. <laughs> oh, take that out of the tape. Do we have a lot of listeners from eastern Canada? Uh, sorry, there, bye. By stopping, 
We affirm that we believe in God's narrative for our lives, defining who we are, and not in the, I have to get this job done or I'm going to get fired narrative. By giving up control, we give him loving control in a way that says, Lord, all of my identity and being and life and who I am is in you. And all of my longings are for you. And I am made for you. And you have called me by name. And you have this eternal future with you that Sabbath is pointing to and preparing me for. I grew up in a church with a huge Sabbath tradition that I hated. I mean, some kids wouldn't be able to go out and play on Sunday because their parents made them sit at home and read. My parents had to keep their Sunday best on and sit at home and read in the generation that they were a part of. It was legalistic in so many ways. Thinking about it all this week and all the freedom that we now have, to, I mean, Sunday's really, other than the morning, not all that different from any other day. I wonder, what have I lost? My dad, was I still see him in the workroom downstairs shining his shoes on Saturday night because he don't shine them on Sunday. And my mom was making soup in our traditionally rolled home on Saturday, and peeling the potatoes on Saturday so that Sunday could somehow have a little bit more space and for, for time to be different and relationship to be maybe more real or somehow by turning away from something, we turned through something to something so beautiful that I kind of mourn losing that. And I'm not going back to the legalism. But Amber said to me this week, we want to start thinking more Sabbathy, you know, just to create the, the ritual and the cadence in our lives again. I want that too. Isaiah chapter 30. The prophet, speaking the word of God, says... You make plans, but not mine. You make deals, but not in my spirit. Anyone stupid enough to trust in them will end up looking stupid. All show no substance, an embarrassing farce of a life. Your salvation requires you to turn back to me and stop your silly efforts to save yourselves. Your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me, the very thing you've been unwilling to do. I think we all, every one of us here, needs to reclaim a little bit more of a Sabbath practice and worldview. Obey this commandment. Uh, that sounds lightning worthy. Obey this commandment just a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, we, you know it if you work in this city. In a Western society, economically driven world. It's, it's a bit crazy. You know that it's probably innate in you, built into your being, I think God has put something that says, you know what, this, this is true, this Sabbath idea, and you need to step into it. Frederick Beekner, great writer and thinker, the room is quiet. You're not feeling tired enough to sleep or energetic enough to go out. For the moment, there's nowhere else you'd rather go, no one else you'd rather be. You feel at home in your body. You feel at peace in your mind. For no particular reason, you let the palms of your hands come together and you close your eyes. Sometimes, 
It is only when you happen to taste a crumb of it that you dimly realize what it is you're so hungry for you can hardly bear it. Isaiah again. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And how gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. And whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it.